miss a video from the Aesthetic Clinics and Dr. Devrat Shroma. treatment for wrinkles and its effect on dry eye. Dr. Shah, please. Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, always interesting uh, to be a corneal surgeon in an oculoplastic meeting, but uh, um, I'm just going to try and show you uh, something which may be um, of interest. So, um, uh, where is the So um, I'm not sure whether you're familiar with uh, Tixel. Um, this is a uh, um, this is a, um, a device for um, skin rejuvenation. So um, uh, my, my interest is not skin rejuvenation. Um, uh, one of my uh, colleagues had noticed that uh, he'd been treating a lot of his patients, and um, he'd uh, seen that their dry eye had improved. So I'm actually just going to present a little bit of uh, our initial work on that. So this is um, uh, sort of a patient uh, who's had Tixel treatment. So it's, uh, um, it, is, uh, it has been developed just for skin rejuvenation. Um, there's, uh, I understand there's about 15 units uh, in India, and the first um, unit has just gone into an eye uh, for a corneal unit. So... I'm going to have to just uh, talk you through dry eye since you probably don't do an awful lot. Um, the, so, so dry eye is um, completely different from what we actually were originally taught. Um, so it's been reclassified. So although we have ocular symptoms, um, you now have a, um, a combination of, uh, in the definition of instability. So uh, hyperosmolarity, so increased concentration, and inflammation. And... We all know this is a big market. I mean, we're talking about uh, probably 50% of patients in uh, um, many Asian countries. Um, but we don't have good treatments. So um, Tixel itself um, is a very simple device. You can see um, uh, the, the handpiece um, uh, is as uh, demonstrated there. I'll show you a little video in a minute. And um, essentially, we do um, a treatment with the um, with the head there. So for um, for skin rejuvenation, that's a uh, one centimeter head, um, and you just go um, around the face um, or um, different areas uh, depending on what you want to do. Um, for the eye, this is um, uh, this is uh, somewhat smaller, um, and it's a very uh, it's, so it's a four hundred degree. Um, tip, so you're doing a very controlled burn effectively, um, but uh, the contact is eight milliseconds, although you can vary it, um, and the uh, and the depth is only 400 microns. So this is uh, um, an eye treatment uh, occurring. So um, I, I'm sure you use IPL for uh, rosacea as well. So um, so treatment time is very similar to using um, uh, uh, IPL. Um, with this treatment, we do um, um, 10 shots on each uh, eyelid. So as you can see there, there's a, um, uh, there's a one centimeter um, uh, head for uh, face and body and a smaller one for um, around the eyes. So this is uh, the treatment. It's uh, coming in, um, just touches um, the skin, and uh, creates a very localized um, thermal effect. Um, this is the um, the head. <coughs> and um, heated up to 400 degrees. So obviously it sterilizes itself as well. And um, uh, that's all you see in the um, in the patients. You just uh, um, you just see an imprint of um, 
uh, sort of uh, on the fr front surface. So this is um, this is very different from something like a carbon dioxide laser, which will actually take off um, a lot of the surface. You don't um, you don't actually remove anything here. So we, um, uh, fo uh, following these anecdotal res um, uh, sort of results, we decided to do a um, uh, a full study, and um, uh, we follow uh, we followed the IPL protocol that um, uh, we tend to use around the eyes for dry eye as well. So um, so uh, three treatments two weeks apart, um, and then we followed them uh, um, sort of. Uh, 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 for another two visits um, out to about three months. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, we had quite easy recruitment for this because uh, the side effect from the treatment is that uh, they'd lose their wrinkles. Um, so uh, all my staff were lining up to be uh, patients um, for this. So this, uh, this is the very early data that we have. Um, uh, crit um, criteria were um, as on there. So... Um, but uh, those of you who still treat dry eye, you know that um, it's actually very difficult to, um, to measure impact. So um, we did a number of things. Um, we had um, two questionnaires, a speed questionnaire and OSDI, um, measured the tear lab osmolarity, which is the, the new device to um, treat uh, concentration effectively, non-invasive tear breakup. Um, as corneal refractive surgeons, uh, we wanted to um, see the impact on the keratometry because there's a lot of evidence of uh, dry eye impacting keratometry for your biometry and uh, full assessment. So in the first part of the study, we had um, 35 patients, um, as you'd expect, uh, largely women. And um, these are the results of the um, speed questionnaire. So we have a, a baseline, so the, um, the higher the number, um, the worse the dry eye. Um, typically, um, a, a dry eye patient has a, dry, um, has a score of 9.9. .9. So, we um, so the group was um, relatively dry. And you can see after each treatment, um, we had an improvement. Uh, so it's, uh, it's very nice to show, um, obviously statistically significant. And if you look at this in a different way, um, so, so this uh, um, this color is um, severe, um, uh, sort of um, moderate, mild, um, and you can see that uh, uh, from the baseline to after treatment, there was a, diff a significant change in the um, in the ones who would be considered. So all the um, all the severe cases disappeared. So non-invasive tear breakup time. Um, we showed a modest um, improvement, but I have to say that this was quite a difficult group because um, these were um, a, a lot of these were patients who, had, who were waiting, who'd failed lots of other treatments. So we recruited them as a, um, uh, as a trial. But um, normally, when you look at non-invasive tear breakup time, um, you expect a two or a three-second improvement to be considered clinically significant. And um, we were getting 64% who improved by two seconds and 50 second, uh, 57 improved by three seconds. So tear osmolarity, um, interestingly, this didn't change. So what this tells us that um, we're not affecting the concentration of the tears, um, but what we're probably affecting is the myobomium gland function. So we're increasing the stability of the tears. So we, we just broke this up a little bit because um, we had s uh, we had some patients who were straightforward, and some patients who were re relatively complicated. There were post um, uh, post uh, cataract surgery with multifocal lenses, extremely unhappy because they couldn't see because of their dry eye. Um, they'd all had um, IPL before, um, and so this is uh, this is the normal group, and as you can see, um, they all improved. Um, but interestingly, um, the complicated group um, improved as well. So, so these are patients who've failed um, lubricants, steroids, IPL, and then we've given them Tixel, and they improved. So um, this device is giving you something else on top of uh, uh, what everything else is available. And um, 
what happens uh, compared to uh, in dry eye for the last two, three years, the big thing has been intense pulse light. Um, so if you, if you compare uh, the results to intense pulse light, actually Tixel um, on the speed questionnaire is giving you exactly the same results um, as IPL. Now, I don't know how many of you use IPL, but uh, certainly as um, we have some concerns, there's a huge amount of light going near the, uh, um, near the retina. I mean, it might be fine if you're using it on your face, but around the eye, even though you're masking it, um, y you're using, I can't remember the figures, it's something like 20 years of worth of light in one go. Um, and you don't know what that long-term damage is going to be. So there are some reasons to be considering uh, other devices. Um, I mean, this is one of my patients. Uh, you can read this for yourself. This was somebody who couldn't see after their cataract surgery with multifocal lenses just because of their dry eye. Um, and this is, um, this is only one treatment. So just in uh, conclusion, um, as I said, normally a speed question <laughs> expect a 9.9 .9, um, in, uh, indicating severe dry eye um, and a improvement of two would, in, uh, in, uh, would mean a clinically important difference. Um, with, with Tixel, um, we've got an uh, improvement in six. Uh, we've also got a significantly increased uh, non-invasive tear breakup time. Uh, so a little change in osmolarity. Um, so we don't understand the mechanism at present because the amount of heat coming out of this device cannot reach the myobomium glands. Um, it's only very superficial, but we're clearly having some impact on the myobomium glands. And uh, I think this is uh, quite an exciting device. And certainly for aesthetic surgeons, uh, you've got potential two groups of patients to treat now. Thank you very much. Mebomin glands, and that is how it is, uh, I mean, maintaining the osmolarity. Yeah, I, th I think that's the presumption, um, mm -hmm. because, uh, uh, it, I mean, we're, we're treating skin, so the only thing really we should be... Uh, and is it being applied to the upper lid also? Yeah, so 10 shots on each lid. For both the upper and the lower. Yeah. Very but, nice. Uh, but this is very early data. I mean, we're, we're, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're working out settings... Um, duration of, uh, of the treatment and, uh, uh, in fact, mm -hmm. how many we need to do. So uh, I think we'll um, improve a lot uh, sort of going forward. Something like the lippy flow. Like in the lippy flow also they exert some no, amount of pressure no, and... The uh, lippy flow actually tries to <coughs> suck out the... Um, um, the yeah. This, um, what we think we're doing here is actually making the myobomium glands work properly. Peter, I mean, uh, anecdotally, we've ha I've had a couple of patients who uh, had a, um, a very blocked myobomium gland. We didn't touch it, you know, you but you could see it was raised. And um, both of them, three days later, it burst. So we think we're, uh, we're doing something to the function. Very nice.